So this week, we're looking at system design, building upon what we started to explore last session on systems analysis. Now we're getting more fully into the unit on systems engineering and systems engineering research, looking at the creation of a dynamic systems model or simulation model of the organization that you're going to be studying as part of your assessment. And we're going to be exploring a range of research informed educational transformation approaches through the use of systems modeling. So in this session in particular, we're going to look at causal relationships between systems and the elements that comprise these systems and how we can make more formal causal loop diagrams. So last session, we looked at connection circles and using those to um, create uh, a systems model. And now we're going to take that and develop it into more formal causal loop models. So in the tutorial this week, uh, come along prepared to share the causal loops that you've created. And we're going to go through how you can do that in a moment. Okay, so systems change. The fundamental nature of systems is that they are constantly undergoing change and that we can model that change. And in particular, how various aspects of a system affect other aspects of a system and cause them to change. So you'll have many personal experiences of things changing um, and your experiences of the organization that you're studying in how various elements of that have changed over time. And these are generally the, the things we focus on in building out our systems. Now, of course, we're going to be looking at an educational technology and how it is going to affect change, or hopefully. Um, but there are many other aspects of an organization that are subject to ongoing change. And these can be used to help identify those things that are important to model within our system. So some aspects, um, systems change over time and how these change over time are things that we need to understand. And the period of that change becomes important. Sometimes it changes rapidly. Sometimes it changes very gradually. And the change is either constant, increasing, decreasing, or fluctuating. Okay, so once we have information about how things are changing, we can graph that. That's a common way of exploring how um, data sets are exhibiting different behaviors. And we can look then at the slope to see the rate of change, um, or whether it's oscillating or um, fluctuating in a particular pattern. Um, and we can also look at how things may extrapolate into the future based upon change, where if um, it is continuing to increase, taking that into the future, it will continue potentially to increase into the future. And we can use graphs to help identify those changes. But that's just one aspect of exploring change. We can also incorporate such changes into a system model and see how they interrelate to other aspects that are changing. So let's have a look at a causal loop um, little video clip here. A causal loop, also known as a feedback loop, uses arrows to show how parts of a system affect one another. Using this tool helps move the focus away from linear cause and effect to seeing circular cause and effect. Often, cause and effect relationships are described in a simple linear fashion. A cause creates an effect, and that's the end of the story. A great example of this is, we have a problem, we take action, the problem goes away, and again, end of story. Causal loops show that the story actually continues. A problem affects the amount of action, which comes back around and affects the problem which continues to affect the amount of action. Here's a more specific example. If the amount of money in a bank account goes up, the amount of interest earned goes up, which causes the amount of money in the account to rise even higher. Loops are either reinforcing or balancing. This is a reinforcing loop because all else being equal, the elements continue to move in the same direction, either rising or falling over time. The story of this loop describes the money in the account going up over time. Here's another example. 
If the amount of stress goes up, the coping strategies to deal with that stress go up, causing the amount of stress to go down. With the stress now low, coping strategies are reduced, thus allowing the stress level to go back up again. This is a balancing feedback loop. Because all else being equal, the elements either oscillate or seek a goal. The story of this loop describes how stress can go up and down as an oscillation. A plus sign indicates that both elements change in the same direction or that the first element adds to the next. In this case, the stress goes up, so the coping strategies go up. A minus sign indicates that the elements change in opposite directions or that the first element subtracts from the next. In this case, the coping strategies go up, so the stress goes down. Identifying loops in isolation can be difficult. Finding them within other diagrams, such as stock flow maps, is a good way to get started. Here are two stock flow maps showing two different perspectives on Cinderella's level of happiness. In the first example, if Cinderella's happiness is low, the fairy godmother's concern goes up, which increases the ability of Cinderella to participate, which increases her happiness. As a result, the fairy godmother would be less concerned. This is a balancing loop, which results in Cinderella's happiness increasing quickly at first and then slowing down, all else being equal. In the second example, as Cinderella is kind to others, her happiness goes up, which causes her to be even more kind and thus more happy. This is a reinforcing loop, since her happiness increases more and more with each time around the loop, again, all else being equal. Notice that we've drawn boxes around the stocks, even when they're represented in a loop. This simple practice helps to see the key accumulations in the system. Thank you for watching this short introduction to causal loops, brought to you by the Creative Learning Exchange. To see additional examples of causal loops. Okay, so it's a bit of an overview of um, causal loops and the idea of re reinforcing and balancing loops. Um, so now let's look at how we can go about um, developing such things. So as you saw, stock is the foundational element of any system. It represents values that can increase or decrease. And it can be a whole range of different things, um, be it water or money or air quality, or animals. Um, as long as it can be measured and it can change and it can either increase, decrease or oscillate up and down. And it changes over time as we have what's called flow, where um, something can cause that stock to increase or decrease. Okay, and as we explore such models, we can see that they are either balancing or reinforcing. Um, and a balancing loop, if you add up the number of negative um, arrows, if it's a odd number, then it will be a balancing loop. If it's something else, it will be a reinforcing loop. But a balancing loop will try to keep within a certain range. It will oscillate. Um, that a reinforcing loop will tend to either increase or decrease exponentially. Okay, so we can use feedback loops to explore lots of different things. Um, world population, um, epidemics, uh, interest rates, confidence levels, fertility levels, exercise rates, um, and a range of other aspects. Okay, so there's a couple of readings for this week. Uh, the first is looking at the basics of causal loops and how to actually draw the diagrams. And so have a look at that and you'll see the various symbols that are used and how we construct our causal loop diagrams. Um, and again, it'll go through um, the idea of the two types and how we can count the number of negative connections to determine 
if it's an odd number, which will indicate that it is generally a balancing loop. Otherwise, it would be a reinforcing loop. Okay, so you take your connection circles and then we can turn them into stock flow diagrams. Um, essentially, they're the same thing. The loops that we identify in our connection circles are the same as the loops that we identify in our stock flow diagrams or maps. Um, but the connection circle process makes it a little bit easier to identify those. But to see the interactions occurring, we have to eventually take our loops that we've um, identified in the connection circle and turn them into stock flow diagrams so that we can then interact and change things, um, whereas a connection circle doesn't quite allow that level of functionality. Okay, pretty much you've understood all of that. So we use the two techniques generally in tandem, um, connection circles to quickly identify the loops and then stock flow diagrams or maps to then expand those out in more detail and how they interact. Um, because sometimes the, uh, the loops that we identify in our connection circles can be all over the place um, and they're hard to sort of represent and see how they might be distinct and how they influence various other loops. Okay, then there's another um, reading on drawing causal loop diagrams in a little bit more detail now that uh, the first reading, you looked at the actual symbols and how to actually physically draw the, do the diagrams. Now we're going to go in a bit more detail as to how to arrange the diagrams and, and construct them in more complexity. And as a little summary, there's a little PDF that um, goes through the range of different possibilities when creating our causal loop diagrams. Okay, then we've got a little interactive tool that will let you create um, a causal loop diagrams. Um, it's a relatively simple tool. There are other tools that we're going to look at that allow us to do more complex things. Um, and we're going to use those when we turn our causal loop diagrams into simulations. But to get more familiarity with doing causal loop diagrams, uh, this tool called Loopy is a useful tool to help us visualize simple causal loop diagrams. So here's a simple one where we've got um, some rabbits and the more rabbits there are, we'll eventually end up with more foxes Of course, there's more rabbits for the foxes to eat. But if there's too many foxes, then they're going to eat the rabbits and will eventually there'll be a, de um, a decrease in the population of rabbits, which will mean the population of foxes will decrease. So here we have a good example of a balancing loop where it's going to keep oscillating. Um, the rabbit population will increase, followed by the uh, fox population. Then the rabbit population will decrease, followed by the fox population until it gets to an equilibrium point again where the rabbit population starts increasing again. Of course, there's not enough foxes to eat them. So these diagrams can incorporate a range of different elements. In this one, we have four different aspects, looking at cars and air pollution and various other elements that we can then simulate. And some of these are positive and some of these are negative. Um, and we can also uh, reinforce various connections if one is more important than the other so for example um between air pollution and can't quite read it uh, i think it might be respiratory diseases um if there's a really strong influence we can do two lines which will double the uh, impacting factor as a result of changes in air pollution on respiratory um, illnesses And then we can do loops where they interact with other loops. In this case, looking at um, various causes and effects of depression. And go on and create more and more complex loops. Um, 
and how we draw them now. So what you're going to do is you can put some text in. Uh, there'll be a little button which you can click on to add labels. You can erase things by using the eraser. But the main thing you're going to use is the pencil. If you draw a circle, it will form um, a connection circle on uh, and um, yeah, it'll form it on the screen. And then you can do, use the pencil to draw lines between your circles, which will make connections between the nodes. Um, and it'll draw an arrow from where you've started your pencil drawing to where you've ended up. And if you want to change from plus or minus, I think it starts off with a plus. Um, in the top right, you can change it to a minus if you want it to be a negative impact. And you can also move things around using the move button. So there's just those four elements. And with that, you can then save your diagram. Um, you can save it as a HTML file, which will be like a website. Um, you can save it as a, a link to where it can be accessed online, or you can save it as a um, animation. It'll be a, um, an animated GIF or a series of images animating. Okay, well, let's have a look at um, the tool. Oops. So here we've got a couple of things already drawn with a negative... Um, link at a positive link. So if I draw another one now, let's put one over here, just draw in a little circle, and you can adjust in the top right um, the, the initial values. Now, we this tool is very simple, so you can't actually give specific numerical values, but if you want it to start off with a small value, you can have it as a small circle, or a large value, you can have it as a larger circle, and those values will change over time as the model simulates. But being a very simple model, we can't actually apply um, numerical values to these. But if I draw a couple of links now to that, so we'll put a positive causal link going that way and another positive going this way. So now, if I play this little simulation, we and if I click on one of these to start it off, so we can see values moving around our system. And we see that the something one is a balancing and the something else and the something is balancing. It's going up and down and oscillating. And the red one is also oscillating, which is interesting because I would have thought it would have been um, exponentially increasing, but whatever mind. Oh, I see. We've got something is also causing negatives happening. Okay, I have to have a look at that in more detail. But you can see how you can very quickly um, put your main elements into um, this program called Loopy, and you can get a basic simulation going. We're going to do more complex simulations in later weeks, but just try doing some basic ones just to get a greater understanding of how causal loops um, work. Okay, so in our session, um, in our tutorial this week, um, we're going to have a look at your uh, loopy causal loops that you've created. So share those onto Teams. Now you can share them as a, a link to the um, to your online um, saved um, loopy causal link. Um, that's probably the easiest way for us to have a look at it. Or you could also try saving it as a GIF and sharing that, but however you want to experiment with saving it and share. So a couple more readings to go into more detail about using causal loops, particularly around understanding organizations, because that's really the purpose of what we're using them for, to understand better the educational organization that we're going to be applying and educational technology too. 
So have a look at this paper, which looks at um, a project management example, but that's relatively similar to what we're going to be doing for your transformation plan, where you're introducing a new technology into an organization. This particular paper just looks at the general management of an organization, but the same sort of principles and ideas apply when using causal loops to explore and understand an organization. So come to the tutorial prepared to discuss the project management causal loop paper and how it relates to the causal loop diagram you've created and the system that you're exploring. So that's it for this week. Relatively light on readings. Um, of course, we're going to be exploring more the practical side of developing your causal loops in the tutorial. And I will see you then.